Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Rick Stumer here at Tunnel and Warren Chapel United Methodist Churches and I am so thankful that the Spirit of God drew you into this time together. We are gathered apart, but yet we are together by God's Spirit. God has been speaking to me in a great deal about unity for the last several months. There's so much divisiveness in our world today and Jesus' prayer for us is to be one as he is one with the Father. We aren't going to delve into the entirety of that today, but we will this fall, starting September 19th, when we'll be doing a whole church study of Francis Chan's newest book, Until Unity. Today, we're going to focus on what should unify us as Christians and on what we should be building our lives, our churches, and our community, and our world. So let's sing, let's hear from God's word, and let us pray as we prepare for God's message for us. Far from the near, we gather to be close to God, but always God dwells in and with us. No matter how far we wander, God's Spirit is as near to us as our very breath. From far and near, we gather together called to unity in Christ, built into one body. We are the dwelling place of God, May God guide our steps and direct our ways that we may reveal God's love in word and deed. Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in the time appointed, his reign on earth begun. He comes to break oppression, to set the captive free, to take away transgression and rule in equity. He comes with succor speedy to those who suffer wrong, to help the poor and needy and bid the weak be strong, to give them songs for sighing, their darkness turned to light, whose souls condemned and dying are precious in his sight. He shall come down like showers upon the fruitful earth. Love, joy, and hope like flowers spring in his path to birth. Before him on the mountains shall peace the herald go. And righteousness in fountains from hill to valley flow. To him shall prayer unceasing and daily vows ascend. His kingdom still increasing, a kingdom without end. The tide of time shall never his covenant remove, his name shall stand forever, that name to us is love. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, flow through our worship, dwell in this us this day and, and in all days. Speak through our words, breathe into our thoughts, and gather us together as one community of faith. Build us together on the, the foundation that is ours in Christ Jesus, who is our cornerstone. Flow through our days that we may be a reflection of your presence. In your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Our gospel lesson today comes from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 34, and then verses 53 through 56. Hear these words from the New Living Translation. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him 
all that they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and, and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and they got there ahead of them. And Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. And then starting at verse 53. After they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret, and they brought the boat to shore and climbed out. The people recognized Jesus at once, and they ran throughout the whole area, carrying sick people on mats to wherever they heard he was, and wherever he went, in villages, cities, or the countryside. They brought the sick out to the marketplace, and, and they begged him to let the sick touch at least a fringe of his robe. And all who touched him were healed. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for all of us. Thanks be to God. Today we gather in prayer and we're going to reach out and touch the Lord and ask him to bring healing to those that need healing, those that uh, need caressing and, and comfort in the midst of loss, those that are... Uh, traveling, uh, we're asking for travel mercies, and, and other needs as are requested. But right now, I encourage you to pick up your phone and pull it out and message me. You can text me at 740-304-5133. Again, that's 740-304-5133. Or you can open up your email app and you can email me at Pastor Rick at tunnelumc.org. Again, that's Pastor Rick at tunnelumc.org. And when I get those requests, I will pray with you and for you. And whatever need that you have or need that you express. And if you request it, I will share it with the prayer warriors who will pray with you and for you as well. But if you don't request that I share it, it will remain between you and me and God, and that's it. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Loving shepherd, you lead and you guide, you walk alongside, and you prepare, you feed, you call all of your sheep, even those of us who are lost, those of us who stray constantly, those of us who stay close to your comforting staff. We are grateful for the lush green pastures of our lives, and, and we pause now to offer our thanksgivings for the goodnesses of our lives as we lift them up to you in our hearts in this moment of silence. Thank you, Lord. And there's so many who walk in the shadows of fear and suffering and despair. And we pause now to offer our prayers for the broken and bleeding places in this world. We also offer our prayers for the sheep of our own flocks, in our families and our friends. And in this, our church, and our community as we lift them up to you in our hearts. O oh, loving shepherd, we have all we need as we live in you. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Our Old Testament reading, or the reading from the Hebrew Bible, comes from 2 Samuel chapter 
7, verses 1 through 14a. Hear these words. When King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I'm living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, go ahead and do whatever you have in mind for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the, the Lord said to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord has declared. Are you, one, are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel's tri tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people Israel. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? Now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth. And I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past. Starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people, Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. Hey kids, I'm so happy you're here today. I can't see you, but you can see me, and even though I can't see you, I know that you look different than me. You probably have more hair on your head and none on your face, we don't look the same. We're different. Not just in our looks, but what we like as well. I mean, for example, what do you like most at birthday parties? Cake or ice cream? And if you like ice cream better, you probably know someone who likes cake better. Or if you like cake better, you probably know somebody that likes cake ice cream better. And if you like cake, guess what? I like ice cream better. And just because they like cake better than ice cream or ice cream better than cake doesn't mean they can't be your friend. Okay, here's another. Would you say you're be a better singer or a dancer? Well, I can't do either very well. But I'd say I'm a better singer than I am a dancer. How about you? Just think of the fun we could have at a party of if some people sang and others danced. And one more question. If you could only have one person over for dinner tonight, would you invite a friend or a family member? Ah, whether it's a friend or a family member, I think all of us would have a great time with someone that we loved very much. And in our Bible lesson today, we, we learn that differences make being part of a group fun. Like when I ask about the singers and the dancers, that would it'd be so fun to have different people together doing those things. And without singers, what would the dancers dance to? And, and without dancers, the singers would be just singing to the wall. That's no fun. Sometimes our differences can make things difficult too. When you have cake and ice cream eaters at the party, you have to buy both, which can be expensive, but I think it's worth, this, worth it to see everyone enjoying that treat. 
And then you can get to have a bite of both cake and ice cream. Yum. And there's a lot of things that make us different. Some of those things we share with a couple other people. Other things we that might make us different and and we may feel like we're the only one like that. And when we feel alone and apart from the group, the Bible calls that feeling like an outsider. You feel like you're outside the larger group. Sometimes that can happen when a new person comes to your school or even if they come to church. They can feel like an outsider. And when you're an outsider, many feel sad or mad and are usually pretty lonely. You know what? Jesus would always find those outsiders and, and welcome them into his group. He would invite them to dinner and he would sit with them to chat. And the Bible verse today says he remembered. He wants you to remember when you felt like you were an outsider and when Jesus welcomed you in. Now you're part of the group. And it is your job to find the outsiders and, and make them feel welcome too. That's the way our group, our, our church can be filled with different interesting people. And our parties can be the greatest. So remember, you were once an outsider. But Jesus made you feel like an insider and he welcomed you in and he wants you to do that for others. So let's pray together. A God of celebration, thank you for inviting us to be Christian. We love the different people who are here, how we work together to show love. We know other people who feel like outsiders. Help us to welcome them so they can be part of our love too, that love that Jesus loved us with. Amen and amen.
Listen now to these words that Paul penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church at Ephesus from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, and I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews, who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now, you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when, in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with his commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and and our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his Spirit. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. If many of you know Dolores and I very well, and I know we've only been here about two years, but Dolores and I enjoy working with high school age foreign exchange students. It's so cool to experience their enthusiasm as they live out their dream of studying in the USA. They all have some mastery of the English language. Some are better than others. And and many tell us they were here to improve their English speaking skills. And some just wanted to speak English without their country's accent. And for many, it's the first time they get to hear English spoken with the Midwestern American accent other than what they hear on the television The first student that we had, that we hosted from Japan, he knew English very well on paper, but he struggled at first with hearing and speaking because we have sounds that they don't have in their language. At first, our conversations with him were slow because he heard it in English, he translated it in his mind to Japanese, then formulated an answer and then put it back into English and spoke it out to us. And if he didn't understand something, he'd say, one moment, please. And then he'd input something into his iPhone, which had a translator app on it. And then his eyes would light up and, and then he'd answer us. After a while of being there, the, the translator app went to the other side and the conversation became more natural and free flowing as he became more fluent in English. Didn't have to go back to Japanese in his mind before he er, answered in English. And after a while, some of the other students that we hosted commented that it was awkward talking to their parents and their friends back in their, their home country in their native tongue because they were so used to thinking and speaking English. And when we hosted back in 2014, that first year, we were fascinated by that app that our Japanese student had on his phone that, he, that brought us together with our student as he learned to think and respond in English. And here in 2021, I I have an app on my Pixel phone that 
can listen to a conversation in another language and it'll caption it in English on my phone. And since I don't know the other language, I'm not sure how accurate it is, but it can do it. And it must be fairly accurate because as world athletes gather for competitions like the soccer's World World Cup or and they gather with their, fan, fr- their fans there and they're in countries that they don't speak their native tongue, more and more using these apps to bring them together around whatever sport it is that they love, no matter the language spoken or where it is held. Uh, they even say it helps them uh, meet a girl or a guy in, from a different country and have a conversation. If only there was a similar app to bring people together around other topics. Say, red versus blue. Trump Republicans versus other Republicans. Bernie Democrats versus Biden Democrats. Citizen versus non-citizen. American-born versus an immigrant. White versus black. Men versus women. Traditional versus modern versus contemporary. Our divisions are deep and, and we need an app or or better yet, a a redeemer. Let's look a little closer at some of the the divisions that we have as examples. The one that seems to be in our face all the time if we hear the news is one political party against the other. This era is proving to be almost, if not the most polarized America that has ever been. But it's not just the Democrats versus the Republicans. The Republicans are fighting against each other. There's those that follow Trump unswervingly and call those that don't rhinos, Republicans in name only. I guess I fall into that category since I'm, I've identified as a Republican all my life, but I'm more in the mold of the compassionate conservatism of Ronald Reagan in the Bushes. And even among Trump Republicans, there's a, the fight over which is the greatest Trump follower. The Democrats are also fighting over how liberal their policies need to be or how big the government dole needs to be. Neither side wants to sit down and negotiate legislation to improve America. They just want to see their side win and, in order to do so, demonize the other side. I guess Abraham Lincoln faced similar things. In 1860, when Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States of America, Several southern states started to secede from the Union one by one by the time Lincoln took the oath of office on March 4th of 1861. In his first inaugural address on that day, he used words to reverse the course of separation and to hold the Union together. And he closed with these words, In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies, though passion may have strained it, must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone over all this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union. When touched, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. As Americans, we are aware of our history. We know that these words did not dissuade the Civil War. It was winding down as Lincoln took his second oath of office. So Lincoln, in his second inaugural address, was retrospective and and looked to begin reconciliation. He said, neither party expected for the war the the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph. 
and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. And it may seem strange that men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not, lest we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Unfortunately, in our current American political divide, we still read the same Bible and pray to the same God and still invoke God's aid against the other. Both sides feel that they are on God's side, and, and yet, as Paul writes, Jesus came to break down the wall of hostility. The divide isn't just limited to the political realm. Just ask the people of, 18, of the 1860s. It spills over into the everyday life. There are countless ways to sort people into categories. And I often hear that we are more divided than any other time in recent memory, and, and maybe we are. Video footage of random strangers being hateful appears weekly. Asian Americans being mugged and pushed to the ground supposedly because COVID-19 was first identified in China. Some people look like American citizens and some don't, or some people assume. A woman wearing a t-shirt with a Puerto Rican flag was harassed by a man who was charged with a hate crime, who apparently didn't know that Puerto Rico was a part of the United States. Mia Irizarry says she hopes the encounter widely circulated in a video shines a light on what's going on with racism nationwide. The incident was more painful for Irizarry, she says, because a nearby police officer took no action while she was being harassed. The inaction was an eye-opener, Irizarry said. In that moment, I realized that the officer and the man were treating me like a minority. They were treating me as if I was less, so to speak. She said, I knew if I reacted, even if I was out of, even if it was out of self-defense, I could have been criminalized. I could have been the one to have been, had the bad rep. Irizarry didn't make didn't look like an American citizen to the man spewing those hateful comments. And sadly, Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour in America as we worship a Lord who prayed that we would all be one. Local churches divide over the color of the paint in the sanctuary, hymns over the hymns that are sung, over the instruments that are used in the worship, and the list goes on. Even denominations, including the United Methodist Church, are figuring out how to split. For the first thousand years, the church was one. However, in, 10, in 1054, it, it split into the Western Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, as both sides excommunicated each other over two words in the Nicene Creed. And then just less than 500 years later, the, the Protestant Reformation began as Luther hung those 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg University and the church again split. Now in 2021, less than 1,000 years after the first church split, there are over 45,000 Christian denominations worldwide. They all claim to be following the one who prayed to his father as recorded in John 17, 11, that they, would, they will be united just as we are. The vision is easy. It makes life simple. It, it doesn't require much thought. It's, it's our default setting. In reality, though, how divided are we? How, how divided is America? Business Insider set out to answer that question, and they found out that most of us are a bundle of contradictions. In Iowa, farmers are trying to reconcile their core conservative beliefs, especially on social issues like abortion, 
with their need for immigrant labor. It shows many don't fit neatly into a single political party. They also found that key issues that most people agree on, including the idea that immigrants make our nation stronger. Most Americans see newcomers as a good thing. The most re re recent iteration of the Cato Institute's findings uh, showed that 69% say that immigrants contributed to the economic growth in America, and just 34% described them as a burden and reduced wages. wages. Our divisions, however, are not as firm as they seem to be, at least it suggested by the example of a Jewish deli run by Muslims. The Jewish delicatessen is an iconic American institution. Pastrami, corned beef, and brisket are usually the trifecta of meats atop the menu at a traditional Jewish deli. The deli was originally kosher, and, and now the meats meet the halal standards, which are very similar to the kosher standards, but it's been owned by the same Muslim family for 50 years. David's Brisket House has survived as a neighborhood staple and a truly unique blend of cultures. We may be divided by, about health care and about climate change and, uh, and about different issues, but beef brisket draws people together. So how do we live without, with division? Do we buy into the polarization? Do we despair and give up or do we seek out the common ground that we do have? Paul is already assuming common ground when he writes to the, the church in Ephesus. As citizens of a divided nation, we might seek the same kind of shared purpose. God brings us together, but we need to practice living with the unity that God has created. Joan Blades knows that the country is hugely divided. When other people feel hopeless about that, she has an idea. She says, we've always been proud of this country for having different political and religious beliefs and being a proud, functioning democracy. We're not doing well on this right now, she says. We need to reinvest to connect with each other. And as the name implies, Blades believes that reinvestment in those connections begin with a simple conversation in a living room of a house or an apartment, a space nearly everyone has in common. And after promising to leave judgment and political agendas at the door, she says participants engage in the simple yet radical act of respectfully considering one another's points of view on the topic at hand. It's just six people sitting around talking, says Blades who launched Living Room Conversations in 2011 with uh, Amanda Catherine Roman, a corporate leadership consultant. And after testing the concept in a pilot program, it's about creating good relationships with each other. This is really a listening program. Where we see differences, God's grace is a force for unity. We can either resist that movement or become a part of it. It's always tempting to resist. Why join with someone who's not as skilled or as smart or as special as we are? And yet God offers this starting word that all of our mental divisions don't matter. In God's love, all of us share the same place. We are all human beings that are loved by God. And the change that Jesus brings to our lives makes us all heirs of God's covenant. That's what Paul tells us. In the book of Ephesians, everything we once were, all of our cherished labels, Paul says, are now erased. Jews and Gentiles have been made equal in God's sight. By God's work through Jesus, the, the change in us through Jesus is so great that all of our former divisions become meaningless. God, through Christ Jesus, has broken down the wall of hostility of our own creation. All of us have been transformed in the same direction, moving us closer to God and making us more and more 
like Christ Jesus. As Kyle Fever writes for Working Preacher, Paul is talking about unity, not uniformity. This passage trumpets the good news that God has brought uncircumcision and circumcision together. One radical element of this message is that God's unification of the two groups does not mean uniformity. One group does not have to fall under the power of the most dominant group. Rather, Paul says that God in Christ has made one humanity of the two. Gentiles do not become Jews. Jews do not become Gentiles. Rather, both Jews and Gentiles become united in Christ as Jew and Gentile. The circumcised and the uncircumcised are welcome into this story. The uncircumcised are welcomed into the story that God has played out through the people of the circumcision to play their own part in the continuing story of redemption. Bridging this whole gap, this huge gap, which defined everything about daily life in Paul's world is not something that human beings have to work on. And it wouldn't be something that humanity could agree on. But God has already done it. Paul says. If this were our job, we would grow weary or give up. But this is God's work. Our job, though, is to live with this transformation. We are called to live in the kind of spiritual community that reflects this unity. Our transformation is a gift from God, and we pay it forward with lives full of welcome for other people, reflecting the welcome that we have received from Christ Jesus. We are no longer strangers to one another, but people who share a family. Sorting people into into categories and, and treating them accordingly is very simple. Finding the unity that we have with one another takes energy. Fortunately, Jesus has gone ahead of us to do the work of creating unity between us and and people on the other side of any divide that we can imagine. Now our calling is to live with that unity, to bring it to life, to honor it with our shared life. There's no app for that. But we have the power of Jesus on our side. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of mercy, we lament that even good actions of reform and renewal had often unintended negative consequences. Lord, have mercy. We bring before you the burdens of the guilt of the past when our forebears did not follow your will, that all be one in the truth of the gospel. Christ, have mercy. We confess our own ways of thinking and acting that perpetuate the divisions of the past. As communities and as individuals, we build many walls around us, mental, spiritual, physical, political walls that result in discrimination and violence. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, have mercy. And let us continue in prayer through the words of the psalmist from Psalm 130. Help God, I've hit rock bottom. Master, hear my cry for help. Listen hard, open your ears. Listen to my cries for mercy. If you, God, kept records on wrongdoings, who would stand a chance? As it turns out, forgiveness is your habit, and that's why you're worshipped. I pray to God my life a prayer, and I wait for what he'll say and do. My life's on the line before God, my Lord, waiting and watching till morning. Yes, waiting and watching till morning. O Israel, wait and watch for God. With God's arrival comes love. With God's arrival comes generous redemption. No doubt about it. He'll redeem Israel. Buy back Israel from captivity to sin. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. 
He is our peace who breaks down the walls that divide, who gives us through the Holy Spirit ever new beginnings. In Christ, we receive forgiveness and reconciliation, and we are strengthened for a faithful and common witness in our time. Amen and amen. From far and near, we have been brought close to one another in the heart of God. And as we wander forth in the world, may we remember that God dwells in us and that God's Spirit is as near to us as our very breath. Thanks be to God. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.
our sister, one with our brother, one family by the blood.